and some sort of fiber, wood fiber material into one product, basically, right? Like the outer layer of a shingle with the inner layer of some strange 50s sheathing concoction stuff. of yeah. sheathing materials. And there's probably an asbestos layer in there, too, for good measure. <laughs> Welcome to the Fine Home Building Podcast, our weekly discussion of building, remodeling, and design topics aimed at anybody who cares deeply about the craft and science of working on houses. This is Senior Editor Patrick McComb. I'm joined by Digital Brand Manager Rob Watsack. Hello. Deputy Editor Matt Milham. Hello. And Producer Jeff Rose. Howdy. Please email your questions to fhbpodcast at taunton.com. You can find previous podcasts and check out the show notes at finehomebuilding.com slash podcast. So did you get your little mishap taken care of? Oh, yeah. I, I guess the oversized water water mug. Uh... What is that? <laughs> I thought you were bringing a grenade in here, but yeah. it was too big for that. It's like a mortar casing. I don't know. It, it threw me off balance, and I practically fell down the stairs. <laughs> so when you spill that much water, you've made a situation. Did you like get a shot back out? No, or no. I, I actually, surprisingly, was able to save most of the water. I don't oh, know. that's good. I was worried. sucked it right off the stairs. <laughs> no, actually, I think that was the first time those stairs have been mopped in like 10 years. <laughs> I'm sure we're going to get some company-wide email about <laughs> leaving a mess in the stairway, yeah. I'm sure. No, just like job sites, you always should leave it better than you found it. Boy, that is a... a I wish more people felt that way. Well, um... Did we mention this already? Who was the Irish gentleman in down in New York City that we showed up as, on his job oh, site and... I've never been on a job site like that. We God, gotta, that was the cleanest job I mean, I've we, ever been on. We complimented him several times, and and he he can't be complimented enough. I, it must be a joy to work on his job sites. It was so tidy, and and he he reminded me that like when you have high end clients, like you need to the job the construction site can't look like a construction site. It sounds like. <laughs> <laughs> if you see my desk, you guys have seen my desk. <laughs> well, uh, my neighbor, I don't know that I have that kind of discipline. <laughs> my neighbors uh, have had a painter working in their house all week. And, um, you know, it's like I'm always warning them for what things to look for and to point out and to document in advance so that in case there's any problems on a project. It, it's a shame. You shouldn't have to do that. I mean, the whole point of hiring a professional is so that you shouldn't have you to worry about You have to babysit about, them. Right. You shouldn't have to worry about that kind of stuff. But uh, she's just been a little stressed out. But, and, you know, remodeling is a stressful. Is stress he a slob? Hole. Well, he's not tidy. <laughs> <laughs> I'll let you make that distinction. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you know, if I were working in somebody's space, granted, the room you're working in, you kind of expect to leave a mess to some extent, especially if it's a room that they're not using while you're working on it. But to leave other rooms in the house a mess is just kind of un unacceptable, I think. Oh, yeah. Yeah. It's all too normal, but not acceptable. <laughs> <laughs> so we heard from our uh, buddy, Ben Bogey. Oh, yeah. Yeah, because was it you, Rob, who asked him about phone glass? Yeah, when we were talking about that glavel, glavel, you, you love that word, don't you? Glavel. <laughs> uh, glavel, which is basically a foamed glass product that can be used as a substrate for slabs and it's foundations. It's like an aggregate. Yeah, and but it's porous, almost like a pumice material, or or it's like full of bubbles, I guess. Uh, so it acts as an insulator too. And um, I had mentioned that years ago when I was just working for Green Building Advisor, Alex Wilson had written a few articles about foam glass which is a material that's apparently been in Europe for decades and is widely used, especially in commercial, for insulation. Yeah, and it's a it's like a block shape. Yeah, but it comes in bricks or slabs. And it's also made of glass? Yeah, it's the same exact type of process. Interesting. And uh, so I found a few articles that he had written about. He used it on his house at the time. It was only being marketed towards the commercial or industrial market. This was probably close to 10 years ago, and he loved this stuff. You can work with normal carpentry tools cutting this stuff because it's foamy and soft, even though it's made out of glass. Can't imagine you want to breathe that stuff in. But, oh, my uh, God, that sounds horrible. Yeah. But um, they, Owens Corning, I think it was, was making it, and they tried marketing it here for a few years and didn't have any luck because it's so much more expensive and it doesn't have the support network or the the familiarity and the industry, and we all know that in our country, f familiar materials often win out on job sites, although that's changing over, you know, as time goes on. But uh, 
So they pulled it from the U.S. market, and I read something that Scott Gibson wrote about it, I think, on our website years ago that said they're just waiting for a better time to try to reintroduce it to our market. That uh, jives with what Ben uh wrote to us. He said, Rob, I've used foam glass on one uh, passive house project. It was a structure that was about two-thirds on piers, and the other third was on a traditional basement stem wall. We used the foam glass between the top of the pier and the girders, and between the stem wall and mudsill. This thermally isolated the structure from the ground and exterior temperatures. It's a cool product with pretty crazy compressive strength. It works very well with standard saws, etc., uh, after that project, a friend was pricing a project from the same architect where foam glass was specced, being applied to the exterior of the, of the foundation down to the footing level. It's a great product in that application, but shocker of shockers, here's the rub. It's super expensive when compared to other methods. Like many high-performance materials, it's super common in Europe, and I'm pretty sure that's due to the fact that the supply chain and they know how uh, the know-how are in place to support it. Hopefully that makes its way across the pond before too long. Best regards, Ben. Thank you for that, Ben. You know, there are so many materials we use that seem like a compromise, whether it be durability or cost or how carefully they have to be installed. And or assembly. embodied energy, I think we should add to the list. Sure. And and this just seems like a great product because, one, it's, it seems indestructible. I mean, from at least from natural, you know, normal. Glass natural, is like, pretty impervious. Yeah. yeah. And, and it's... A easily recyclable material. So I think a lot of, like I said last time, I think that a lot of it can be produced as a byproduct or waste product of the glass industry. Cool. What do you think about this? I like it, but I did look up, I was like really kind of just like scratching my head about the compressive strength because it doesn't seem like it would be all that strong. Because it's like, it seems foamy. Yeah. And it, from what I saw, it looks like it's about 90 PSF or PSI. I think it's PSI. Yeah. So that's not, it seemed like a little low to be putting on the top of a, a pier. <laughs> well, once <laughs> it's flat, girders. it's all fine. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, like underneath a sill plate, it seemed like okay, yeah. but I wasn't sure. Like I, I was still scratching my head like what this looked like. Yeah, I don't know either. It ben, could have been a big pier. Us, yeah, if Ben can send photos, that would be fantastic. This is, uh, we'll just say it was architect design, so yeah. <laughs> I'm sure it's fine. Uh... In episode uh, 210, we asked if there was anything uh, inherently wrong with a deep energy retrofit on a 9,000-square-foot house. Uh, I'd say we got several uh, thoughtful answers. Some of them were very lengthy, and we will put those up on the podcast page. But I I wanted to uh, read what Hank wrote about the subject, and then we'll get to uh, our little brief conversation about what we all think about it. Because the idea was to ask our listeners what they thought, and then we would weigh in what we thought. So they're going to go first. So uh, Hank was typical of the response we got. I loved hearing you all discuss work vehicles and fuel economy a while back, and I think I love this question even more. I'm a residential remodeling carpenter. I live in Minneapolis, and I'm 28 years old. A depressing number of my peers live in dread as they are convinced we are all headed toward a retirement that looks less like a tropical vacation and more like Mad Max Fury Road. Climate change is apparently a very real issue, and according to countless articles I've come across on a regular basis, we have very little time before it's simply too late and the damage is irreversible. Between inefficient buildings and a consumeristic obsession with remodeling homes, which are already fine, it's no secret that the construction industry contributes an embarrassing amount to climate change, and it makes my heart a little heavier every time I haul a barrel out to the dumpster at my current project. I've had those very same sediments uh, myself. He says, I really enjoyed reading the article by uh, Sarah Susanka you shared. I have very little to add to her argument, though. I would say I would change the emphasis from smaller buildings in general to simply less square footage per occupant. When you mentioned in in the show that something about 9,000 square foot home, I did a quick Google image search since I don't think I've actually ever seen a home that large. Everything I came up looked to me like they were built mostly just to tell their neighbors how much money they had or to hopefully end up online somewhere as an article saying, look at my 9,000 square foot house, and not to actually make anyone's life easier or more comfortable. The only question I can come up with this, how many people actually live in these homes? A quick stroll through Ikea will convince most people it's possible for two people to be comfortable in a 300 square foot uh, dwelling. Something tells me that a house that is written up in an architectural magazine because it is 9,000 square feet does not have 30 occupants. I understand that we are doing our best with the resources we are given. 
and that includes people who were born into situations which gave them a different perspective than my own. I'm not throwing shade, as the kids would say, on anyone for their individual design choices. If you want a big house, build a big house. I only hope that I continue seeing more and more people get involved in these conversations so they can be more fully informed when making their decision. Thanks for putting this question out there, and thanks for all the great content you provide that helps all of us use more environmentally friendly materials and more efficient building techniques. Wasn't that nice? That was nice. Yeah. Yeah. I think both of our, our uh, all of our responses were equally thoughtful, and I, they yeah. took a similar tone, I would say. Yeah. So what, what do you guys think about the 9,000 square foot deep energy retrofit? Oh, so, you know, living in the part of the country that we do, uh, where there are plenty of clients who can afford 9,000 square foot houses. And to completely remodel them. Yeah, it, it's tough. <laughs> it, yeah. It's tough being a creative person and having this work environment because, you know, in some parts of the world, you just don't have the opportunity to work on projects like that. And it's like, I don't want a 9,000 square foot house. In fact, my house is pushing 2,800 square feet, and that's including a semi-finished attic that's not heated. And um, I wish I had a smaller house, actually. I mean, I it's... I wish I had a smaller house with more thoughtfully laid out rooms. And that kind of goes to what... What do you think about, though, is there inherently anything wrong with a deep energy retrofit on a 9,000 square foot house? Is that a good thing? Is that a bad thing? Is that a neutral thing? I I mean, if the 9,000 square foot house already exists and our existing housing stock is one of the biggest contributors to uh, the the energy or or climate problem, I, I would say make it better. I don't know. I'm going to get back to that, but what do you think? <laughs> I'm really, I really struggle with this question because, I mean, it really depends, I guess, on the amount of materials that are going into it, you know, the embodied energy that's going into all those materials. I mean, and how long that particular iteration of that house is going to last. Before someone Before thinks... Before the next person comes in and wants to completely redo it again. Right. So, you know, it, it, if this house is going to last hundreds of years, then... It may be worth it. You know, I mean, I'm sure it takes a ton of energy to, to heat and cool that place as it is, um, and you'll reduce that load, but is the amount of carbon that you're putting into the environment to by creating carbon. all of those materials yeah. and getting those materials to the site and all that, it, does it offset that? And if it doesn't, then I say, no, don't do it. Mm. But, I mean, it, it, it may be mostly for comfort that they're dealing, you know, that they're doing this stuff. I don't know that they're really doing it to reduce their energy bills. If they can afford a 9,000 square foot house and to update it and do a, a deep energy retrofit on it, they can certainly afford the, the power. Uh, probably, right? Yeah. yeah. And I mean, they could just put out a bank of solar panels and just heat the hell out of it. And it doesn't add anything to the global warming potential of that house. I mean, they can bring it to net zero just by... Like uh, solar a field farm. of yeah. <laughs> solar panels. What were you going to say? Well, yeah, I mean, that, that is, I mean, as far as deep energy retrofits go, from an economic standpoint, it's hard to justify them. Most houses, it's so much more expensive to add insulation to the house to make it a more affordable place to live. Um, and But you pointed out that, that, that comfort is one of the reasons to consider a, a retrofit, too. But, again... There were some articles in um, GBA a while back when solar started becoming more affordable that, to your point, would it be better just to solar the heck out of the house? But that doesn't solve comfort problems, is your point. Yeah, I mean, well, it really depends on the house. I mean, you know, that's the thing. It's like if you you might be able to make the house less drafty and just put in a more robust heating system in there or cooling system in there and do it with solar and... There's a lot less uh, materials, but it's, it, can, it can be so complicated. I think it's a case-by-case case What do you think, Jeff? Uh, I, I keep thinking about uh, Peter Yost's presentation at uh, the summit and, you know, talking about it's like all right, the carbon that's already been spent on that house, building that house. Over the long term, if you can reduce the carbon that's being added, I think, you know, you're better off. But it's a, it's a long time to pay it back. A mm-hmm. long time to pay it back. I don't know. I, I like you, ha- have a difficult time with this question. I, I, the embodied energy of the deep energy retrofit uh, is troubling to me. But tradespeople doing important work 
uh, and getting paid a decent wage and supporting families and paying taxes uh, is also very important, you know, for our society. So wealthy clients um, can pay those bills and uh, we should let them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, you're, you're, you're not going to stop wealthy people from building second and third and four fourth homes that are that big. If you can build a house that big, chances are you probably have more than one house. Yeah. And um, as much as we, some people think that's wrong or they think that's wasteful, I mean, that's, I think that's their prerogative. It's a consumer society we live in. Yeah. But at the same time, I do think that a lot of people buy things for the wrong reasons. And I feel like you know, if you look at Sarah Susanka's books, she talks about how it's not necessarily about the size of the house. It's about the utility of the house, the, how well it's designed to meet the needs of your, your family. Yeah. So I think, if anything, it's, it's more about making smart choices, doing all your homework and deciding, does it make more sense to insulate the hell out of this house or to put a better heating system in and put, a, uh, put solar panels on the roof? Or does it make sense to leave it the way it is and pay high move, energy bills? Pay high energy bills or, or move? Yeah, I, I don't know that there's an easy answer to this question, and I think there are pluses and minuses. We'd all agree. I think the the what I would say is if you can keep the embodied energy of the retrofit to a minimum, uh, staying away from foam and concrete and these kind of things with tons of embodied energy, that would be the best possible scenario. But it's a, it's a great question, and uh, if any of you out there want to weigh in on this, we're, we'd be happy to hear from you. Yeah. I'd like to. Uh, one other uh, feedback item. Uh, also in episode 210, we talked about uh, who instruct, in, inspects structural steel connections in residential work. We heard from Jeff from Seattle, who commented on the F- FHB podcast page. Uh, Regarding welded steel connections in residential light construction, our firm will do our own details for accessory items like awnings or porches, and we generally go for the overkill method you mentioned. Uh, For a structural steel beam with welded connections, we defer to an engineer. In either case, we add the following note as required by our jurisdiction. Uh, Steel assemblies to be fabricated by Weibo, certified fabricator, or field inspected by a special inspector. Uh, this is in Washington State, whereas the note implies the certified welder is usually the route to avoid costly special inspections. So they have a certification program, and I don't know what's involved in that, but yeah. they have Weibo certified welders that need to do these important structural elements. Yeah, so that's the Washington Association of Building Officials. So mm-hmm. it's not necessarily a welding certification, as it is a certification based on their code requirements. I wonder, I, I did a quick search and wasn't able to find the list because uh, I didn't have time to keep digging, but only, uh, not every state has those types of certification programs, but then the American Welding Society has structural steel certification, and I imagine if you're certified through them that that's probably an easy path to being certified on a local level if required, but, or at least it gives you the cred to, to, for people to trust you to do what, what you're supposed to be doing. Yeah, and this is important, that you can't have hacks doing this kind of work. Yeah. Uh, you're going to put a new door in your house. Yeah, between the breezeway and the kitchen. <laughs> and you found something, right? And you, I you, did. You bought this where? Uh, at It's called the Door Jam. Isn't that nice? It's in... The Door Jam? The Door Jam. You're kidding me? It's the name of the place. <laughs> <laughs> it's in, I, th- I can't remember if it's Hurley. It's between like Hurley and Boyceville, New York. Did they? And like, tell me, how many doors <laughs> does the Door Jam have in their warehouse? Probably at least hundreds, maybe thousands. Get out. I don't know. I've bought other doors there in the past, interior doors. I need some doors. Y- yeah. You had mentioned that place to me when I was looking la- uh, a few weeks ago, and I think I'm going to have to check it out, because that door that you... Is that the one you bought right there? Yeah. That's I'm exactly. Buying, I haven't actually so it's, picked it up yet. it's a half glass with two uh, rectangular panels below. It's a very traditional style, wouldn't you say? Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. So that's the exact door that I think that I could probably fake out with some applied trim, those double arched windows that would have been common on my 1870s house. That mm-hmm. sounds like a cool project. Yeah. Yeah. I'll but, probably yeah. draw it in CAD and have someone CNC it out for me. At it. So you're going to have to <laughs> set this up yourself because it's just a blank. Or yeah. you're actually going to put it in the existing jam. I'm going to put it in the existing jam. And so, yeah, it's a weird size for an exterior door because it's 32 inches wide. Um, but the main reason for getting this, um, I 
bought a better cat door, like a better weather sealed cat door to go between the kitchen and the, <laughs> and the breezeway because cool. we got three. You cats. didn't get the passive house model, did you? No, no. no. <laughs> they, but I mean, they make you know doors that already have some pretty nice cat doors and stuff like that installed. But I'm you can not... buy an entry door with a pet door already in it. Yeah, no they're kidding. really expensive. And oh, I, I bet I wasn't about to do that. So. Um, Anyway, when I was about to put it into the existing door, it, there's already a cat door there, but it's very tiny. And yes. It's not very good. Right. Um, the, it's really more of like an interior door in it's sort of like in the panels that are in there. It's like a quarter inch panel. Um, and I was like, there's no way that I'm actually going to be able to get this cat door in there. Because it's seal meant to it. go in an inch and three quarters thick yeah. entry door. And it is an inch and quarter three inch and three quarter thick on the rails and sure. styles, but not in the panels. Yep. So. It wasn't really going to seal right, and I was like, I'm not going to build this thing out just to make this thing work because this door is obviously leaking like a sieve anyway. Right. So I uh, went to the door jam and picked out a, a hopefully better performing door. Cool. It's very handsome. Yeah. Are you going to paint it, I presume, ahead of putting it in? I'm not sure exactly how I'm going to. I can tell you the fur uh, veneer doors like this one do not last long in the weather if they don't have yeah, paint it, on them. It won't really see weather. It will just see cold. Uh-huh. So, yeah, there's no rain or anything that's going to get on it. Or oh, is it going to that breezeway room? Yeah. Yeah, there's like a, I don't know, like a French doors at one end of the breezeway and a steel door at the other end. So, hmm. Cool. Yeah. Nice. So when did you send us those pictures? Was that Sunday? Yeah, so I had for the Thanksgiving uh, weekend, I had five guests over. And then the last two of them walked out the door, I turned and they literally turned as they walked out the door and looked at my dishwasher, and all the lights in the front of it were flashing. <laughs> <laughs> my, That's a reassuring sign. <laughs> my my in laws killed my dishwasher. No, it was on its way out. The thing, this dishwasher was like twenty five, at least twenty five years old, and I'm surprised I got it lasted. That so you long. bought a new Bosch dishwasher? Washer? Uh, actually, no, GE. GE. Okay. GE, yeah. And uh, and stainless steel. Stainless steel. Stainless steel tub with a poly something floor inside, and uh, um. Got it. It it was on the holiday Thanksgiving weekend, so it was like on sale. It was like Black Friday sale, which was so. If you're ever gonna kill one of your appliances, <laughs> the, right after Black Friday is a perfect time to do That's it. That's why they it was go like, on sale then. Yeah, it was yeah. like four hundred dollars off. I can tell you, the day before Thanksgiving is not the day to try and buy a stove. No, no, <laughs> <laughs> it's very very expensive. I I. I was, like, getting ready for guests. I'm like, well, I'm going to clean the oven, right, with yep. the self-cleaning feature before they come, you know. And <laughs> it fried the, the circuit board on the on the oven. So we had to cook the turkey breast on the gas grill. I've always been scared to use that self-cleaning function. Well, for good we've reason. Never, you, we've never done it. <laughs> and yeah. I've heard others tell me subsequently that they've had problems with that. Yeah. And it's, it's toxic, too. That's another reason not to do it. In fact, if you read the owner's manual to your <laughs> electric range that has a self-cleaning feature, they tell you not to do it if you have birds in the house, like mm. pet birds, because it will asphyxiate or they them. they tell you to put a canary in the kitchen to make sure it's safe <laughs> yeah. to go back in there. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, that's a good time to move on. Yeah. <laughs> but we're not even done with this story. So you, the photos so, you sent were, yeah. So we got to keep this moving here. So my yeah. house, you know, built in 1871, remodeled probably many times. Uh, prior to me, the last time was probably between like 1978 and 1986. Most of the work was done, and um, who knows? That's, I don't know if that that dot washer couldn't be that old. Well, anyway, but keep so this I, moving, I, kid. I pulled it out. I pulled it out, and I. You know, I I was expecting pretty nastiness, and it was just like, it was probably one of the ugliest like holes I opened up in my house yet. I mean, just I mean, you expect mouse crap to be in there, and um, but then just like a three quarter inch gap between the drywall and the subfloor where you could just see the breeze just blowing in there, and um, the worst of it was they didn't have a long enough wire going to the. Uh, dishwasher. So there was like an eight inch piece of wire sticking out of the wall. They stuck that in the end of a double gang box with, they did use wire nuts, but then they used duct tape as electrical cover. tape <laughs> and as a cover over the wire, yeah. over the box. <laughs> and it was long gone. The duct tape had been shredded by the mice. And uh, I don't even know how they got the dishwasher to slide in there because this box was just sitting on the floor in the middle of where the dishwasher was. Somebody just probably held it back with a stick while they pushed it in. <laughs> Push harder! <laughs> yeah. 
So I've been spending the past couple of evenings trying to make it look like a civilized. Uh, I think we got some pictures of that, Jeff, right? No. But, uh, no. I'll put them on the podcast notes. I mean, but uh, yeah, it was, it, I, I put a new, I had put a laminate floor in the kitchen. And so it, it had been, the dishwasher was sort of stuck behind that. And I, so I put in some plywood to bring it up to, up to the height. I put an electrical box in the wall, ran a new piece of wire. So how'd you get that out of there with the flooring in front of it? So you had to I turn did, up the legs? I just had to crank the legs all the yeah, way. Okay. Once I did that, it was fine. But I really didn't want to put my hands in there to crank those legs up though. <laughs> <laughs> and you wouldn't either listening because if you've I, seen the photos, it was I pretty always, foul. It I pretty a, much, yeah, the, I pretty much always wear those ni- heavy nitro gloves whenever I do work like this now. I mean, just to keep my hands clean in general, but this was one case where oh, I, that's just, gross. It was I didn't gross. want to, yeah, no. But So I still haven't installed a dishwasher yet, but it looks civilized now. I just got to slap a coat of paint in there and make some uh, water connections. So, Sweet. Yeah. So what have you guys been doing without a dishwasher? Um, you, you can wash them in the sink, you know, with a sponge. What? I got a dishwasher. <laughs> it's called a daughter. No. <laughs> no. No. Kaya would be Not like, no really. way, man. Yeah, no, she, she empties the dishwasher. That's about it. Um, yeah. You can uh, wash dishes in the sink? Yeah, well, really? my prior dishwasher was really just a dish rinser because if you put anything, any dirty dishes in there, they wouldn't come out clean. So <laughs> it was time to get a new one anyway. Uh, I don't have anything to add to this except to say that... Um, so when will this air, Jeff? Uh, week before thanks or before Christmas, I think. So uh, the week after Christmas, uh, December twenty sixth through New Year's, I'm going to be visiting family in Pittsburgh, and I'm going to toss it out there. Uh, if any of you folks in the Western Pennsylvania area want to uh, have a get together, please send an email to the podcast inbox, and uh, we'll try and make that happen. But I think that would be a lot of fun. Uh, and this uh, was from the another. Genesis from the Fine Home Building Summit. I I had so much legitimate fun at that. I was like I, w- I was like hanging around like minded people. So if there are any of them in Pittsburgh, uh, and uh, I'll buy the first round as long as we go someplace uh, cheap. <laughs> <laughs> Just buy a thirty rack of Natty Ice. Go to Shenley Park. <laughs> yeah. Just drink it at the golf course. Yeah. Awesome. Did, did you see those? Uh, was it? PBR has those uh, 99 can cases that they have as like a holiday promotion thing. They're like, <laughs> they're, <laughs> oh, no, I need it's, that. It's like eight feet long. It takes two people to like carry it. Like, it looks like you're carrying a beam on a timber frame job oh, site. Oh, that's hilarious. Um, what a great idea. Yeah. 99 cans. Yeah, huh? they're only available in like a dozen states. Probably because it's illegal to buy that much beer anywhere else. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's good. It was like fifty nine ninety nine for a 99 pack. How much? $59, I think. That's like $50 too much. <laughs> uh, this is uh, our first question comes from Jeff. Hi, guys. I can't tell you how many projects you've helped me accomplish as I renovate my house. HGTV just celebrated their 25th anniversary, and I don't think I've learned a single useful thing from them. Even your long, rambling discussions that yield no answers are helpful. That might be the <laughs> nicest compliment ever. <laughs> yep. Uh, It helps me realize that sometimes there just isn't a straightforward answer in building. I have a question about my basement floor. Our ultimate goal is to finish half the basement as a playroom workout room and leave the other half insulated but rough as storage and for a wood stove. The first task is dealing with the floor. It was clearly originally unfinished with a few concrete pads added over the years, and then a rat slab was rat slab was poured. The end result is that it is uneven and drops four inches from the front to back. A concrete company quoted us $5,000 to level it with gravel and then pour a slab of three inches. Uh, listening to your podcast with Steve Basic made me think it would be a good application for a floating wood floor. Steve did uh, compacted gravel, rigid foam, a vapor barrier, and then two layers of three-quarter inch Advantech laid perpendicular. Would this be a wiser path than pouring a slab? The advantages I see are that it leaves me with a floor that could take a finished floor and I be, might be able to integrate a vapor barrier slash dimple mat on the walls for finishing the walls. I figured it would be about $4,000 in materials with two inches of foam. If it is a good idea, how much foam is worth putting in a house that is moderately well insulated? Can I integrate the wall vapor barrier? Is a dimple mat worth the extra money? How would I seal the post holding the main beam? And would hauling and compacting this much gravel actually kill me? Wow. Hmm. Do you want to take a stab at this? Yeah, well, I'll start out just by saying that uh, when Steve 
to this, uh, they had footing drains on the inside okay. already. So I don't know what this guy has, but it sounds like he already has some water issues. And I'd be a little reluctant to put wood on the floor if that isn't already taken care of. Oh, man. And he's got like pipes and stuff in this old house, right? Yeah. I mean, headspace is going to be an issue regardless of what he adds here, I think. You know, whether he does the slab or he goes with the Advantech. I don't know if he wants to put like, you know, they want to have some exercise right. stuff in there. I don't know if that includes like a pre-core machine or a, right. or a, a treadmill or yeah. what, you know. but Or I an mean, exercise bike that weighs 60 pounds. Right. I mean, I have a treadmill in my basement at the moment, and I got to rip out my uh, drop ceiling because really when I'm standing on that thing, my head, even when I'm just standing, <laughs> is basically touching the, the But he did, he did say he's got 93 inches of clearance on the even on the short end of his Right, house. yeah. So, so, I mean, it's like he'll have like 7 foot 5 roughly or something like that, which isn't terrible. But, Unless yeah. he's like 7 foot. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I don't know. It, it if he deals with the moisture any of the any potential wa water intrusion problems, I I think it's a pretty reasonable thing to do to do like to the, put the Advantech in the foam? Yeah, sure. What? Why not? <laughs> <laughs> I guess you can imagine I see it differently. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I I think you break up the concrete and you pour no concrete and you put insulation under it and do it like we've been doing basements for 50 years. Yeah. I agree. I mean, I I would rip all those pads out and make I, if you don't have a perimeter drain, I would put that in. Put an interior one drain to daylight. Um, that's what Steve had in his assembly. And then, I mean, if you really wanted to do the plywood thing or the uh, Advantech thing, sure, try it. But I mean, it's I think it's risky. I think I would much prefer to go with concrete here. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's just realistically, we're talking about the cost of materials being. Not a huge difference when you're looking at the, what remodeling actually costs, and it's a one-step process with the concrete, where the actual putting down of all of those different layers um, when you're doing this is still wood. a big project. Like he's yeah. got stuff down there that's going to have to be temporarily moved. He's got some point loads it looks like, and that all has to be uh, temporarily shored up, you know. And then you're going to have to put foam insulation down, uh, a vapor barrier. And then pour uh, a bunch of concrete. Now, the point loads look like they're on footings that people poured, uh, uh, you know, and then put the rat slab around it. I mean, would you just leave those in place? If, if they weren't going to be a problem, yeah. Yeah. Uh, there's also a masonry chimney that's going to need to be uh, dealt with, right? I, I, you know, and Steve, I, I, those homes are perfect. There is so much attention given to those passive houses, right? This is an old house. This is not as forgiving. There's going to be water in the basement. You know, it's like, and I, I talked to him uh, subsequently uh, via email, and um, they have a window to bring concrete in. I was going to suggest if you want to bring in uh, gravel, uh, which is a good idea to have, uh, what do you call that, a, a capillary break, mm -hmm. um, you can actually have gravel uh, come from the concrete batch plant they will load your concrete mixer with only gravel and you can shoot it in through a window i've done yeah, that a number didn't of times one of you guys write up write that up in the magazine of, in the past couple of years there was I, yeah I, somebody was like it was somebody put it in as a tip that's a great idea to to just order because the, they already have, they have gravel they have gravel <laughs> they have lots of gravel and they have machines that <laughs> move pump, gravel pump it into places yeah. so yeah and uh i mean that's that saves a lot of backbreaking work and uh five grand seems fair for a concrete company to do this i bet you could do it for half that uh, if you're willing to bust your butt and um i've had great success uh, enlisting friends to help move concrete and maybe that's just weird friends but if you can get some people to help you it's kind of a fun project if you have any uh competency finishing concrete this guy told me he was a contractor for a while so i, I don't think this is outside of his uh, area of abilities but I, you know, you know me, I'm always in my cr crazy old house. I'm always looking for ways to sort of like not break my back doing different jobs. So I'm, I'm usually willing to take my chances with weird assemblies like that. But that being said, certainly a concrete floor in a basement is, is a bulletproof, you know, solution. I'm, uh, I see those basements without concrete slabs in them. Uh, we've seen, I, I think it's three projects I've seen with that now. And uh, they just kind of give me the willies. I, and I, I, I can't give a good reason for that. It just strikes me as, I want to see how they are 20 years from now. Let's just say that. Yeah, it's just something that hasn't been around long enough, it seems like. <laughs> and the older I get, the more risk averse I get, I'm sure. Yeah. And some of those yeah. projects, the, the wood has been, you know, essentially above 
grade, even though it's yep. on grade, like the outside grade is below that. Yep. So the risk of the water sort of like wicking up through and, and wetting that has really diminished. But when it's below grade like this and you've already got water in the basement. Uh, so now he was, you, you, you've uh, followed up with him a little bit. I mean, when he said a concrete person, he was going to have someone come in and do all, the work, yeah. do all the work himself. Um, I'm just wondering if it's, is that based on him not wanting to break his own back or is that based on him feeling... He's going to have to get over that. Yeah. <laughs> it's just Cause hard work. Because <laughs> the thing is, hauling all that Advantech down into the basement sounds like a lot more work than p pouring concrete through maybe a basement ha hatch or something like that. You know, sure enough, sure, raking that concrete out is, is physical work. Finishing but, it is too. Don't yeah. un underestimate the amount of work it takes to rub. Like I think he said, seven hundred square feet of concrete with a float. It's yeah. exhausting, and you need to pull float. You know, it's like it's not going to be a cheap undertaking. But I think that's the only so solution it, I would recommend. So I mean, I think the answer is that it's like how risky do you want to be here? If you're if you want to save a little bit of money and you're a carpenter and you know how to work with the wood and you want to be a guinea pig for that uh, floor <laughs> system. <laughs> And it's just a lot of money to be a guinea pig with. Yeah, mm -hmm. but I mean, the Advantech stuff we know from experience is pretty, um, pretty water resistant stuff. I in my crazy basement projects because I actually do have a portion of my basement done sort of the way that he's thinking of doing, and what I've been planning on doing is basically pouring a mini slab perimeter slab so that and then actually sloping that down to sort of a perimeter drain. So that you're basically any water that would come in is only coming in through my walls. It's not coming up through the floor. So that I'm having sort of an interior portion of it being the Advantech. So it's sort of a hybrid of the two systems. Your house, like this house, like, you know, I just, I worry about uh, putting plywood. I mean, it's like, how many people do you know that have, uh, end up having leaks uh, from their plumbing pipes, you know, if they're 100 years old. It's, it seems yeah. inevitable. Mm -hmm. Well, that's why in my basement, I'm I've only done it on the portions of the basement where there are no, there's no plumbing above. Yeah. Like, I have a workshop space, and I just didn't want a concrete slab in there. I wanted a plywood floor. It's more comfortable to work on. Mm. Jeff asked how much uh, insulation, uh, two inches of rigid Yeah, material. I wouldn't go any more than two. Yeah. In fact, Dana Dorsett, had in, in a question on uh, GBA, someone was asking a similar question, um, was saying just to re the minimum to remove the sort of potential for condensation and mold in a basement is like inch and a half, but it's not like the return on investment going any bigger than two inches in pretty much makes any, no any, sense. In, in any yeah. climate. It's there. There's the there's heat not, flow is minimal that way. Yeah, and I'd say. Uh, order more concrete than you think you need from personal experience. <laughs> <laughs> I'll post a, uh, I'll post Patrick's blog post That's about his, gotta uh, be one of the most published photographs <laughs> in all of uh, FHB history. I gotta say, it's my Was coming up short. Your hair out? Pull, yeah. My coming up short with concrete. We, we've probably mentioned it before, but Patrick wrote, I think it was about 30 blog posts when he was building his barn uh, a few years back. And he, very, that was very early in the process, he, too. He very carefully calculated uh, how much concrete he needed for his slab and was short by, what, half a yard? Yeah. <laughs> and, boy, that was freaking expensive to get half a yard yeah. of concrete. Well, plus just the stress of worrying about finishing that slab. Oh, it's it's not good, I can I mean, tell you. Anytime I've ever poured concrete where I've had a truck show up, I've always had another small project sort of Ready waiting in the wings, in the wings yeah. that I could do. And so yeah. in my defense, I have done that in many cases. I took a 4x8 sheet of plywood one time, like cut it up into 2x2 uh, two two squares with, with and div or divided it with 2x4s into 2x2 two two squares approximately, right? Mm -hmm. And and used a surplus to fill those. Well, then you have these freaking concrete slabs that you have to move the rest of your life. So <laughs> I decided I did not want to do well, that, that again. That, mm. that's, that's a little different. I'm, I'm talking about like you actually have like a pad you need somewhere, not something that like you're just building your own extra building materials. Yeah, I'm like mm. you're making patio <laughs> pavers, right, right, of your own design. Although if you yeah. make them small enough, maybe it wouldn't be so bad. It was bad. Yeah. And then we had to sell the house, and I had to, like, carry these things into the woods. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so Michael has been dealing oh, – actually, Michael's uncle has been dealing with some water issues at his very full Chicago lot. 
He lives in a 1920s three-story Tudor with a full basement. At the front of the house is what we presume was once a three-season room, but has since been fully incorporated into the conditioned space, sans any actual insulating or air sealing. I love how funny our listeners are. What, what's, what's his lot full of? I, that I don't know either. I think it's just got a lot of building on it. Yeah. Um, the original three-season room was built also on a concrete foundation, but it seems the foundation was either just barely at or started below grade, and then the room was framed. A six-inch curb was poured around the front, which enveloped the framing, and then stucco on the outside attached directly to the framing and stopping at the curb. I've attached a sketch section view and a photo from the inside. The proposed fix is to cut all the framing at about six inches up from the foundation, remove all the spilled through concrete, and install a new sill plate on top of the new concrete. The question is, what are the options for closing this back up? My thought is to put up some 15-pound felt and then board sheathing. I hesitate to insulate or air seal, as this will trap the vapor-driven moisture from the stucco in the wall cavity, a.k.a. it's going to get wet, and the only way for it to dry is with warm interior air. I'd be interested in your thoughts on how to address these kinds of issues. Michael, you, 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 you get the problems, right? It's, he totally understands what's going on here. So what's the solution? I'm completely baffled by what I'm looking at when I see this picture because <laughs> there's not a floor system. He says it's a full height basement. And so, no, so no, this, this room is a slab on grade. It, it was a three-season room, and, uh, okay, and then so they this enclosed is like it a, later. Okay, so this is kind of like a, I don't know. A sun port, a porch. Okay. I, I'm still just... So he's got this porch, right? Uh -huh. It was... Uh, so this is like a cripple wall going up with stucco on it. Yeah. Okay. Or I think it's actually a pony wall. It's above mm -hmm. a piece of concrete. Mm -hmm. But it looks like the... Yeah, the grade's too high. So they put this concrete right. and all the... All the but re but really... Lumber rotted. Really, the, the only detail we need to be concerned with is the fact that this guy has a below-grade concrete foundation that someone framed a wall on top of and then capped the outside of it with concrete to to hold up back the dirt. Right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. And then it rotted, go figure. <laughs> <laughs> so so he's going to cut this all off, raise the masonry uh, so it's above grade, presumably. But then he wants to know, uh, there's no weather-resistant barrier on the backside of the stucco, it looks like, or it's mm -hmm. rotted away. How do you keep what uh, the moisture that the stucco is going to take up from destroying the interior finishes is pretty much the nut of it, I can tell. Take the stucco off. Rip the stucco off. Seems I mean, like, that's... <laughs> yeah. I, I, honestly, I mean, it's just going to continue There's, to rot the, the framing that is there without any kind of barrier there. Yeah, yeah that that wire lath right on the studs mm -hmm. and then the stucco applied to that, it's just not, not really... Yeah. Kosher. So you rip this off and... Uh, Put a real air barrier up, sheathing, right? And then whatever siding you want that matches your Tudor style house. Yeah, because the thing is, this is a common, this is, I mean, it's almost. We goes see back this a to, lot. It almost goes back to what we were talking about in my basement. It's like you're trying to find an easy way out of a solution by backing out of it. And in reality, you're better off. This should off, have never been done. You're better it? off starting over yeah. with, a hope, you know, with something that you're not trying to put a band aid on. This is. Uh, yeah, needs new siding. Yeah, I think that's the best solution. Yeah, I don't, I don't see a solution to like. I don't think you're going to be able to insulate that and close it back up. I mean, you know, the, the way it is, it's the kind of thing where the first inclination to somebody would be like, oh, well, you can staple tar paper on the inside, leaving a gap and all that stuff, but that's not going to do anything to protect the framing itself. Right. right? Yeah. I mean, yeah, and that's <laughs> that's what's most at risk here. It's going to always take on moisture, right? Because mm -hmm. any time the stucco gets wet, it's going to go to the where there's less moisture, which is theoretically the framing. So every mm -hmm. time it's going to go that way. Yeah, and then you put insulation in there, and you reduce its ability to dry. Yeah, so, I mean, his uh, suggestion is to allow it to dry to the inside is is helpful, but I think it's a band aid, as you, as you suggest. Yeah, yeah, and then I mean, you've got this space that's incorporated in the house, and it's cold. Yeah, and wet. Yeah. Which makes it feel colder, I've learned. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, Andy from Indianapolis writes, Hello, fine home building podcast people. My name is Andy, and I've been listening for about eight months. I've learned a lot and enjoy listening on my commute. My wife and I are in the demo stages of a 1930s farmhouse renovation. We're taking it back to the studs and replacing everything inside and out. My question is about the flooring in the front room. A 24 by 10 foot slab was added to the front of the house at some point, and half is a front porch, and the other half is the room I'm writing to you about. 
The room was originally correct, connected to the rest of the house by a step up and a narrow doorway. We have opened this up to the living room and there is going to be a vent in the side of the step. We'd like to use carpet squares in this room, and I'd like to know if using three quarter inch rigid foam under the carpet would be a good idea. I have about one and three quarters inches available and still clear the entry door. The slab is raised to almost match the height of the original raised foundation, about 12 inches. Do I need poly under the foam, and should I have some plywood over it? It seems like the sandwich should work, but I don't know if I'm missing anything. I've attached some pics, and there are more on the following Instagram feeds, and we'll put the Instagram feeds up on our podcast page if anyone wants to check out additional photos. So what's going on here, Matt? <laughs> what he's got is a gigantic thermal bridge. <laughs> right. Because <laughs> the concrete slab is both outside and, and inside. inside. Yeah. So it's a, a, a concrete slab that's the, the depth of the house, the width of the gable, right? Mm-hmm. And it's all concrete. Part of it is the porch with a front door. And half of it is a room that's been uh, carved out on top of this space. So, mm-hmm. yes, so all the cold is going from the outside and following that slab uh, to the inside. Yeah. Because, yeah. well, it's actually heat going out. It's really heat going heat out. Heat going yeah. out. Uh. So, so, I mean, <laughs> this is a case where what we were talking about in the basement would work if you have enough room for the foam and the plywood. Yes. But you'd have to put it outside. Right, yeah. too. You'd have yeah. to put it on the outside of the slab. Yeah. I mean, I don't know how he's going to get some kind of a thermal break in there. If You'd you have wanna... to saw the concrete, right? right? And I, that's the thing. We don't really know what this assembly looks like. Is that slab sort of over a basement, or is it on the ground? I don't know. And but... if you could saw it, if it was on the ground, uh, mm-hmm. and put some kind of uh, break in the concrete, that would solve the, the, thermal, bridging. the thermal bridging. Yeah. Um, I think the the... Uh, insulation on the inside would help it be more comfortable, right? Mm-hmm. I don't know that it's it, it's going to slow the the heat loss, but I don't think it's going to solve it. I mean, if you're not going to go as far as cutting into that slab, what do you think about putting... I mean, three quarters of an inch of insulation might not quite be enough. It's not going to do a, a lot. It'll do a little. Yeah. So we're thinking that would be like, what, R3.5, R4, if most rigid insulations are R5 at an inch. Yeah. So that's not a lot, but it would I would probably help. It might uh, control condensation. Mm-hmm. I, I definitely p- wouldn't put the carpet right on the concrete because that is, seems like a recipe for a condensation and mold growth and dust mite growth. Mm-hmm. So basically we're saying then that it's not necessarily a bad idea to put some foam and then maybe some plywood and then some carpet tiles down and... Um, but ideally you'd want some sort of a thermal break to, to get some added benefit to that insulation uh, so that you're not getting the cold slab on the front porch contributing to that. Andy's from uh, Indianapolis, which is a pretty cold place, right? Uh, they definitely mm-hmm. have winter. Yeah. Uh, so I, I think the foam would help, the plywood, uh, yes. Uh, the best thing to do would be to cut it where it separates from inside to outside. And what? Put the some con- rigid foam inside there. Then in, you the, mean? in the gap or some kind of sealant. Yeah. But that's a you know potential structural uh, issue. If, yeah. As you suggest, if it's got a uh, basement under it, then that is something you can't do without the help of an engineer, I'm sure. Or even if someone threw some fill in there, poured a slab, and the fill settled, and that slab is sort of self-supporting, mm-hmm. um, you don't know if you cut it in the middle if that's going to compromise the slab. Yeah. But, uh, but when... The other thing to do is enclose all of it. Mm-hmm. That's not a bad idea. Right? Uh, and if you could insulate the a slab perimeter and uh, cut off that thermal bridge from the wall sheathing or the wall plane. Yeah, I mean, it wouldn't it would be kind of nice if that were a little glassed-in s- side porch Mud there, room. right? Yeah. Yeah, with some, like, boot storage and uh, hanging for coats and sweaters and what have you, earmuffs. Yeah. Mm. So well, so I wanted to make a comment about his uh, his question about the layers. Yeah. So, you know, we've always been we've been told for a long time that you're supposed to put the vapor barrier on top of. So you'll do gravel, then rigid foam, then the vapor barrier, then the concrete slab. And I was always curious as to why that was. I was like, oh, is it in case, you know? It, I, well, anyway, so I I did some reading. And I don't know if it was one of Peter Yost's articles about it, but. Um, one of the main reasons is because if you put the um, 
plastic under the rigid foam, you're potentially creating this pocket where moisture can migrate back and forth between the slab that got sort of trapped underneath there when it was placed. Setting, mm-hmm. When yeah. it was placed. That's the same problem where f- for a lo- long time concrete installers were putting that, what did they call it? It was like a bed of sand that was uh, a blotter, a blotter layer. layer. And it sounded like a great idea. It solved some problems. It made it, it made it so that they could finish the slab faster because a lot of the moisture was moving out of it. But then that moisture was basically a... Uh, Almost like a what do you uh, like a, a wet reservoir. sponge? Well, it was like a sponge. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I mean, it was basically holding moisture that was moving back and forth into the slab and causing problems over time. So I don't know. If There's I, not a, a, a vapor barrier under this concrete, almost certainly. No. So, so if if it is going to become uh, have a floor covering on it that's moisture sensitive, you absolutely have to put that down. Sure, you definitely have to put it down. But I I, I was just commenting on on the the order of layers, like the fact that in a concrete setting you would put the vapor barrier on top of the rigid foam. It probably doesn't really matter if you're not pouring concrete, whether it's above or below the rigid foam. I wouldn't I wouldn't gather. I people just say to put it on top, and that's yeah. my gospel too. Yeah, but because th- it sounded like he was saying to put it down first, right? Yeah. Yeah. So I, in general, the vapor barrier goes on top of the foam uh, below whatever the floor. In this is. case, it would be the first layer. If he's going to do it after the fact, we're going to have concrete, polyethylene, rigid insulation, some kind of subfloor, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, latex paint would work great for that application too, if you didn't want to uh, use plastic, right? Yeah. Class three. Is that enough? <laughs> Two coats, probably. Latex. Yeah. What color? Uh, <laughs> it's got to be periwinkle, I think. <laughs> All right, we got, we got one more. For... So this, uh, this podcast uh, listener uh, asked to remain anonymous. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, Fine Home Building. I'm a remodeling contractor on the west side of Pittsburgh and have started a rehab of a late 20s duplex that had rot and fire damage. My question, however, is about the sheathing. Currently, the home is clad with aluminum siding directly over Insel Brick, which I'm sure Patrick is familiar with and is very common in the area. So have you guys seen Insel Brick in your, in your travels? I think the only time I saw it was when you and I were biking Pittsburgh. around Pittsburgh. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I was like, what is that stuff all over the front of those houses? <laughs> it's Insel Brick, man. There's something else in this photograph that is uh, distinctly Pittsburgh. Can you guys pick up what it is? Oh, the, the little uh, Mary and the... I'm not going to say it. <laughs> Mary in the bathtub. <laughs> so there's a Virgin Mary in the front of this house and a little grotto. And this yeah. is also something you see all over Pittsburgh. Mm. I'm sure in other places yeah. too. But Italy. All over like... Italy. Yeah. All over like, <laughs> you know, the New York City you see in the, in the outer boroughs a lot. Uh, uh, sorry to get sidetracked. That's just <laughs> too fun. Um in order to improve the exterior envelope and create a flat surface for LP smart side lap siding to be installed, we plan to cover the exterior with zip sheathing. I decided to call Huber and ask their opinion on placing the zip sheathing directly on the existing board sheathing. They advised against this due to the fact the materials may expand at different rates causing failure and suggested using zip R to provide a decoupling layer. With that in mind, I asked if I could place it directly over the insel brick, and they stated they don't know have enough information on that material to make a recommendation. Not having to use the insulated zip R would save some costs, but I also have concerns about drying potential with zip, considering we plan to use faced fiberglass bats in all the wall cavities. I love the podcast and would like to know your opinions on that subject, and should I worry about drying potential in our climate? So f- let's get to this first question. Why do you think this podcast listener wanted to remain anonymous? <laughs> <laughs> I'm a little curious. I think I think is because he doesn't want to let the client know mm. that he's asking for advice from us knuckleheads. Yeah, that might be. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's what it is. He wanted yeah. to ask. Yeah, if you go to somebody who knows less than you do about a subject, then you're definitely in trouble. <laughs> uh, so what do we tell so, this guy? So I found an article by uh, a guy named Mark Visser, who I believe is a Canadian. If this has, like, any wall assemblies with insel brick in them, I will be very surprised. It, he's a building inspector from uh, Canada and wrote a, an article called Insel Brick, the Brick That Is Not a Brick. <laughs> <laughs> I love this show. (laughs) Oh, man. 
<laughs> so I should so, tell people first off what this is. Okay. Yes. So have you ever seen Celotex, a Celotex wall sheathing? It's kind of this Brillo pad, fibrous wood wood fiber, and then it's like impregnated with, I think, is asphalt, right? And you have it on your house. Mm-hmm. So this is that, but it has the added benefit of a beautiful brick-looking veneer on the outside. <laughs> or, 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 or stone sometimes. Sometimes too, right? yeah. it's like uh, cut stone, yeah. yes. Hmm. Um, it so, is singularly the most ugly building material I have ever seen. <laughs> well, plus it's asked to do a lot because it's then acting as your siding with no flashing details at the joints. Yes, it's your weather barrier and the sheathing and I, I presume it's like they probably claimed it was had some insulating qualities and, and maybe it does. I don't, yeah. So it's pretty va- vapor and air open, as I understand it. Yeah. I will jump to the last sentence in, in Mark Visser's article about insel brick. <laughs> okay. And it says, during my construction years, I've removed a fair bit of insel brick, and it seemed that in every case, the wood underneath the asphalt siding had been in, infested by a carpenter ants. Okay. <laughs> so <laughs> I would recommend not covering it with a nice new yeah. layer of, of zipar sheathing. That's all got to go. That's all got to go right in the dumpster. Yeah. I- I'm sorry to say, and uh, use the. I can tell you what we used to do at Habitat when we and we had. A, in addition to a lot of homes on insel brick, there's a lot of homes in Pittsburgh with aluminum siding over insel brick because I think at some point people said, "Wow, this is really ugly," <laughs> um, and aluminum siding looks a lot better. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so we would take the aluminum siding to the scrapyard and get a few hundred bucks, which will help offset the cost of disposing of the uh, insel brick layer. Yeah, that's a good point. <laughs> Get rid of it all. Yeah, Start aluminum, over. aluminum's got good value at the scrap yard. Right yeah. yeah. So once you take that off and you inspect it, and if the sheathing's in good condition, do you put zip or zip R back on top of that? Over the insole brick? No. Over once the, the board insole sheathing. brick is oh, gone, the board over the board sheathing. sheathing. Yeah. I was confused as to why they were recommending zip R. Because, I mean, already you're going to have to use longer nails than you normally would well, to attach that I, because they want you to get back I to studs. I wonder about that, too. And then you're going through an extra three-quarter inches of board sheathing on top of that. I'm like, the, I'm just kind to of get thinking a slip that, I'm kind of thinking that it's the, the softer foam layer. Yeah, they're saying it decouples. It allows the right. materials to move independently. But I'm like, why not just put a layer of asphalt felt? If all you're looking for is a uh, Between membrane. the board sheathing and the, and the new, new sheathing. Zip. Yeah. But was that were they talking about that or were they talking about the insole brick? They were talking about no. I think they were talking if you took the insole brick off. They were, and and then he said, "Well, if you can do that, can I just put it right over the insole brick?" And they said, "We don't know." Right. So and and anyone's going to say that because yeah, insole brick hasn't been put on houses for decades. But if it's just about decoupling, I don't see why you wouldn't go with the (laughs) the felt option. You could. I mean, like the for obvious reasons, the zip bar is an advantage because it, mm-hmm. it has a thermal break for the, the framing. Right. And this house is going to have a ton of framing, and I guarantee yeah. they were not shy about putting sticks in these uh, working-class homes in Pittsburgh, I can mm-hmm. tell you. I'm just wondering how... I, I didn't look up the nail schedule for it, so I, I can't tell you, but I'm, you're probably going to be using 16s to attach this. I See, I don't like the... the I mean, I like Zip R as a product. I don't like it in this instance because we, we need a... a, a diaphragm, right? We need a, a sheathing layer that is going to tighten up this house and uh, potentially boost its structure. Mm-hmm. And I, I think sheathing is the way to do it. And I think going right over the board sheathing is fine, but I don't think I would want anything in between. But I, I'm not even sure why you can't just put some exterior rigid foam and furring strips and then right put, over the right over the, uh, the board sheathing and then put your LP smart side on that. I, I think that would work too. Uh, as with any of this stuff, you're going to have to get the flashing details right uh, mm-hmm. for penetrations and windows. When you start adding additional uh, sheathing layers or re- changing them, you have to fix all that. You yeah. know, uh, on that point, I was just, um, you know, when I talked about doing a similar kind of thing to my house where I was, can I keep any of the, because I, I don't even have sheathing on my house. I have clabbers right over the framing. And I was like, can you can you kind of tear it off around the edges and then go, and sort of, Leave that stuff in there if you do it properly by putting furring around the edges and doing the air sealing details. And um, what's he talking about? Whatever. Anyway, <laughs> let, let, let's, let's let's get to the the, the, win, the point. You know, I ramble. All <laughs> <laughs> let's get to the point of, the, of existing windows in a house where you're doing new sheathing and siding. Is a lot of you know we've seen a lot of instances where people back tape 
flashing tape to existing window jams. Um, There's a project I drive by daily that I'm watching that go on right now. They're putting new windows in a, a house with clapboard siding, and they're not taking the siding off, so they're trying to tape to the sheathing layer, and then my presumption is they're going to put wider casing around the window fin, and it all looks like it's going to rot terribly. Yeah. So, I mean... <clears throat> Is the only solution then to literally take out every window and start yeah. over? Yeah. Yeah, and I think he's going to do that. They're, he's calling. I mean, when I call a house a rehab, I, I'm going back to the shell. All the windows are coming out. It's getting all new mechanical systems. It's getting insulated, air sealed, and new siding. All of it. Full. Um, if you guys are curious, this is very typical of the houses we worked at in Habitat, as you might imagine. And you, can we have a shot of the inside, Jeff? Yeah, and they look like that, too. So that thing is uh, badly fire damaged, and that's probably a temporary wall to keep it from collapsing. <laughs> <laughs> so they're going to have a fun project. Yeah. I'd love to know what they paid for this. I bet it was a few grand, if that. You still buy cheap yeah. houses in Pittsburgh, but as you can tell, they need some work. Yeah. Yeah. So do you think we should bring back some uh, insulin brick next time we go to the Vintage Grand Prix? Uh, to show our colleagues. Yeah. In fact, can you? If you get enough of it, I'll build a shed on my, <laughs> on my, in my backyard. <laughs> so, uh, so is it similar to that stuff you were talking about? That was the other fibrous asphalt, like a homosote. Yeah. Celotex or homosote mm. sheathing. Yeah, yeah. So the back of it is like that, but then it has like a, uh, asphalt right. shingle granules. Yeah. On mm. that, and it looks like a layer of tar, and it's um, like embossed with yeah. like a brick pattern or stone pattern it's on it. It's almost as if they sort of merged uh, roofing shingles and some sort of fiber, wood fiber material into one product, basically, right? Like the outer layer of a shingle with the inner layer of some strange 50s sheathing concoction stuff. of yeah. sheathing materials. And there's probably an asbestos layer in there, too, for good measure. <laughs> 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 what, uh, what, do you, what do you think possessed people to come up with this product? Is this like a Technology that I mean better living through chemistry. Yeah, I guess. Yeah. So, um, so the the fibrous material you said it's like a Brillo type material. It's like it's like they can something that's loose enough that they can inject as, asphalt. It's into. a little it, denser than that, but yeah. yeah. I don't know. Mm. How, I mean, I don't know how to describe it and to say it's like particle board, except the particles are like half a toothpick diameter and uh, it's about an inch thick and you can I don't break know. it with your fingers you can yeah. break it with your hands for sure hmm. it's lovely yeah, never, i've never I think seen you should it off of a uh, house. suggest it to kaya for when you guys do your modern house build yeah yeah okay there's probably some modern version of it that I could find. I'm gonna. Uh, that's my. So what was the guy's? Uh, what was the upshot of that article he wrote? The brick that is not, or in, in brick, oh, the brick that is not brick. So is that was, what it was called? Um, I mean, he. The first part of the article was him just describing what it was and <laughs> how popular it was from the 1930s to the 60s, and he said how uh, he's like even today there are still a few insel brick houses in my city that still look good after 50 years. <laughs> And it carried a UL. <laughs> I guess what good is relative. Yeah. It, it said They're not it, falling down. It yeah. carried a UL rating for fire suppression and had an insulating value of R1.3. It was easy and quick to install, provided an excellent hiding place for insects. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> Do you guys remember the discussion about um, getting a, you know, a bus and, and and going on tour and visiting places? And I I think in two. Episode 211, somebody invited us to Vancouver, right? Yeah. Um, and, it, Jeff, you came up with a, a, a prototype of uh, a lovely coach bus, but you guys, <laughs> I, you're I laughing. I, I, think I, I think I was the one who sent you the ad for the next vehicle, right? <laughs> oh, so man. Kylie had some reservations about the tour bus. She said, do we have to take a bus? So I'm sensitive. Kylie, you know, she has yeah. a little anxiety. She didn't want to ride them. I get it. So I, I thought about something a little cozier. And so I, I went on Facebook Marketplace, and I found what I think is the perfect vehicle. So what do you guys think? Awesome. This is, <laughs> this is a 1974 uh, Ford E150 van. It has a 302 V8 engine and uh, a three, three on the tree. So it's got a sh mm -hmm. manual shift, but it's up on the column. But the best part of this vehicle, besides its <clears throat> stellar Exterior graphics is the interior. 
Um, yeah. <laughs> so I nobody's gonna you know, let their kids anywhere near that band. <laughs> so I, you know, I grew up in the seventies and eighties, seventies and eighties, and I have this book from nineteen seventy six. That's a, this book could have come right out of that. this van. Could have this van could have come right out of that book. It's where you know every surface is covered in shag carpet, <laughs> including the ceiling. It's yeah. dope, you might say. <laughs> just needs a, a howling, a the wolf only thing, howling at the moon. The only thing that uh, it's missing it. is one of those chrome chain steering wheels. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but I, I love the the crushed purple velvet dashboard cover. Yeah, that's oh a, my god, nice it's touch. so classy. So my one of my best friends in grade school, his dad had this same model van in brown, and it had the same chrome side pipes and mag wheels. And it was brown, and it had like tall ships uh, in the in the back windows. And I thought it was the absolute coolest thing that was ever made. <laughs> and, and you know the thing is, I dreamed of one day having a brown hot rod van and parked right and next to a Fiero. <laughs> <laughs> as tacky and sleazy as those things are. Um, you know, they're, they're like cultural icons. Like there's probably not that many of them left. And every once in a while I see one come up for sale with a giant mural of like a guy riding a, you know, a, a, a dragon. Unicorn. Or, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Painting of Fabio from some <laughs> romance novel on it. You know, so Jeff, uh, took it, he, he took upon the responsibility to design some graphics for the, the blue van. And I think he did an outstanding job. Um, so those of you, uh, who, so this thing is on on Facebook um, Marketplace for I think it's thirty five hundred bucks. So I don't know if you all really are serious about us hitting the road. We might have to get like a crowdsource uh, thing, and we'll drag Kylie up. Start <laughs> yeah, it, just a Patreon my, just for the fan. <laughs> I had actually been sharing the same uh, the same ad with some friends of mine because I ran across it too, and uh, my wife's almost only comment was you you better get the black light out and. Probably have that. Probably oh, have that do not. Probably. Do not. No. <laughs> do not, do not want to know. <laughs> Nightmares. <laughs> oh man, it's so impossibly cool. Well, unfortunately, that is all the time we have for today. <laughs> thanks to uh, Rob, Matt, and Jeff for joining me, and thanks to all of you for listening. Please remember to send your questions to fhvpodcast at taunton.com. And please send in some design questions. Uh, Kylie has lamented that we haven't had any design questions lately, and I agree. Mm -hmm. Um, Yeah, although I so much love talking about air sealing. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, we've said it before. I mean, as much as we've we've fallen into a groove sometimes with our topics here, we're we want to talk about anything home building, anything or or design or really anything Anything. for that matter. You know, yeah, whether we know about it or not. Especially custom vans. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Custom vans. Are good. We need yeah. that podcast. <laughs> so uh, if you do write in, please remember to include your mailing address so I can send you an FHB podcast sticker. And I'm looking at the camera because one of our recent uh, commenters said that <laughs> we should be paying more attention to the camera and less looking at each other because uh, uh, on YouTube it looks funny. So thanks for listening. Happy building. Happy building.